Such Thank you for joining us. We are in week four of Purifying the Altar, which is chapter six and seven. Therese, Evangelist Teresa Escobar will be our teacher and facilitator for tonight. I will open in prayer, and then the next voice you will hear will be the evangelist extraordinaire. Hey, I hear you, Wendy. <laughs> really, 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 really. <laughs> your, you, your baby's about to pray, okay? <laughs> Father, we thank you for the day. We thank you for what you're doing in our life and through our life. Touch uh, Evangelist Teresa so that uh, we can receive what you have prepared through her, her, her time of study, her time of prayer, and her time of sharing. Thank you, Father, that uh, we want to sow into pure altars. We don't want to be one to, to steal from you, but we want to, to receive the blessings that uh, our seed that we sow promises. Lord, we love you, we honor and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Teresa. Amen. Yes, ma'am. Over to you. Okay. Um, good evening, everyone. I pray everyone is doing well. We are in chapter six of Purifying the Altar, and it's talking about the offering. And what I did is I read both chapters, and I kind of highlighted with the Lord what I felt the Lord wanted me to pull from this book for us to, um, for me to discuss or to bring into, um, I don't know, the forefront, I guess you could say. So the first thing is that um, the first time the offering was mentioned in the Bible was in Exodus 25, chapter Exodus 25, verses 1 to 2 and verses 8 to 9. And I'm going to read it. So we're talking about the offering and we're talking about purifying the altar. And the first time the offering was mentioned in the Bible was in Exodus 25, verses 1 through 2, 8 through 9. And it says, then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the children of Israel that they may bring me an offering from everyone who gives it willingly with his heart. You shall take my offering and let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them according to all that I show you. That is the pattern of the temple and pattern of its furnishings just to just so you shall make it. So here it's saying that the offering was to build the tabernacle. That's And that's first mentioned in Exodus chapter 25, verses 1 and 2 and 8 and 9. The offering, the word of God was to support buildings while the tithe was to support the people, the Levites. There were three specific offerings referred to in the word of God. The census offering, the assessment offering, and the free will offerings. And that's in 2 Kings 12, 4 to 5. Let me know if I'm going too fast. Um, Pauline, can you put yourself on mute? Okay. Thank you. Sure. You're welcome. Now, Let me know if I'm going too fast. Us, can you put us on mute too so we don't get background? No, you're not going too fast. Okay. Okay. So, um, like I was saying, there was three specific offerings referred to in the word of God. The census offering, which is one. The assessment offering, which is two. And the free will offering which is three. These were three offerings that he asked the people to come and bring willingly um, in 2 Kings chapter 12, verses four and five. God had ordained that offerings again, I'm um, saying it again, were to be used for the buildings, but it has been taught in current churches that offerings are for other ministries. This is not God's plan in the word. We must return to God's plan of the offering and the tithe. If not, then it makes it an impure altar. Impure altars defile the land by defiling the people. The motivation behind the activity makes it pure or impure. The motivation of the heart must be checked. So God is not, God wants us to willingly give him an offering. 
willingly, just like he said in um, Exodus 25, 1, 2, 8, 9, willingly give an offering so that the building, the house, the church can be uh, maintained and any repairs that need to be made. And also the tithe, the tithe, there's a basis which um, of 10%, that's the 10th that was in the Old Testament, but also it also can, your, your giving of the tithe, it comes from a personal relationship with the Lord where you seek him and you ask him where and to whom do you want me to give the tithe to? And who are you, who's teaching you? Where are you learning from? Who, who are you in covenant with? Impure altars defile the land by defiling the people. The motivation behind the activity makes it pure or impure. The motivation of the heart must be checked. You have to check your heart. Uh, why, are you, why are you giving, why are you giving your offering and, and your tithe? There are churches that bring in professional fundraisers that use manipulation to raise money in the church. This is a man-made plan and not led by the Holy Spirit. And God is not obligated to return it in any measure. Instead of it becoming a covenant blessing, it becomes a covenant judgment. So there are churches who want to raise money and they invite people to come in and they have a man-made plan of how to, of how to raise money, manipulation on how to raise money for the church. It's not led by the Holy Spirit, by the Spirit of God. And so it becomes a covenant judgment. They, 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 they put judgment on themselves instead of a covenant blessing. Am I making sense? Okay, good. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions? Okay. God is going to reveal his glory and presence upon churches and ministries that are committed to pleasing him. We have to seek God's face for direction on what to give and where to give. Deuteronomy 12, verse 13 to 14. We have to seek God. Let me see if I can find the scripture. Here it goes. Deuteronomy 12, verses 13 to 14 says, Take heed to yourself that you do not offer your burnt offerings in every place that you see, but in the place which the Lord chooses. That's why it says you must seek God where you are to give and what to give, how much money you are to give and where you are to give the offering. That's Deuteronomy 12, 13 through 14. God has intended the covenant of the tithe to be a blessing, not a burden. So you should, it's a blessing to give. We should have a pure heart, a clean heart, a giving heart to give to the Lord. God always intended the giving of tithes and offerings to come out of our relationship with him. Deuteronomy 26, verse 12. We must be obedient to God's voice and leading of the Holy Spirit on the distribution of our tithes and offering in order to command the covenant blessing from the Lord. That's what I have on the offering. Does anybody have any questions? It's... No? Okay. Next, go ahead. when it comes to the offering what is the i don't really understand the law of central sanctuary it's on page 82 82 and i highlighted that too central sanctuary was if i'm not mistaken correct me if i'm wrong was where they had a specific place centrally where they brought in all the offering to for the keeping of the church of the temple that was the central place where they actually brought in all the different offerings and they kept it in the storehouse there so that way if there's anything that needed to be fixed in that temp in the central temple where everybody came they can use the money of the offerings that came in to fix the temple does that make sense mm -hmm. okay Anyone else have any other questions? Sorry about that, that's the printer. Okay, next thing we're gonna talk about is the spirit of Amen. Now, I didn't know there was a spirit of Amen until I read chapter seven, go ahead. You're going to the next chapter. So there were some points that I wanted to bring out that Teresa spoke to. 
One is uh, on page 83. Um, remember the purpose of this class is to learn to recognize pure and impure altars. And so the first pure and impure altar that's listed there um, is um, the motivation. What's the motivation of the person uh, raising that offering? And you really have to pray about why the person is doing it. On the bottom of 82, the top of, of 83, it talks about the motivation. That's going to be impure. You can tell if it's an impure mold, uh, uh, altar by the motivation in which it's given. So you have to pray about that. You have to pray about where you give. The other one, is she mentioned, was the professional fundraiser. When you have people that come in to a church, now you may be a visitor to a church. You may not even know that it is a professional fundraiser, but you should be able to discern by how they are raising the fund if they are motivated out of manipulation. Um, you know, these altars that they give you these different, you know, the Lord told me that a hundred people were going to give a thousand dollars. Who are the hundred people? Well, five people were going to give ten thousand dollars, and the motivation behind that is pride, because you better believe the five people that come down has to march down before the people, and everyone seeing them marching down with this ten thousand dollar offering. And now there might be jealous. We're like, well, Jim can pay ten thousand dollars. I can pay ten thousand dollars. And so then it ends up being 20 people given $10,000. Well, if God said it was five people. How come 10 people are given? Yeah. <laughs> That's real. It, it, it sounds wrong. Either God's lying to the first person. Well, he wasn't or he, sure. <laughs> or he's under something that's manip manipulative. And so you really have to pray about the altar that you sow into. Um, it a little further down in the middle of page 83, it talks about uh, any type of offering or, or dollars that's weaseled out of you that is not, you are not getting a covenant blessing off of the seed that you've sown. You have been manipulated and you sowed into an empty altar. You should be seeing a, a blessing from your seed. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't understand this until I began to truly tithe into the ministries that were feeding me. Um, that the blessing I was making less, the same amount of money over the years, but I had more money in my bank account than I ever had in my life. And it blew my mind. And the only the only explanation is God was faithful to what he said he would do if you, if you sow into pure altars. And so really watching, are you being blessed by your tithes and by your offering to wherever you're sowing? I'm not saying um, you have to sow into KBI or, and that's it. I'm not, I'm not saying that. I'm not even saying that you have to tithe to KBI. But what I'm saying is wherever you are, are you receiving the blessing from it? Is your business increased? Do you see changes in your bank account? You know, what's actually happening because you're sowing? Um, because if you're not getting the covenant blessing, that means you're probably getting the covenant ju judgment because you've sown to an impure altar. You know, that's the importance of why I want us to understand um, where we sow makes a difference. In the bottom, it talks about the spirit of mammon. If a church is operating in the spirit of mammon, that's going to be an impure altar. And I can tell you for sure, every person that's in ministry, every person that's walking in ministry as a leader, you will have a mammon test. You will be tested to see if you're going to serve God or mammon. And many times people will steal from God 
or steal from whatever it is they're stealing from because the spirit of mammon test has been failed. We have to understand that if you fail the mammon test, that means you're, you're going to be open to judgment. And it says in here that it may appear with manipulation, it may seem like you're getting ahead. You, it may seem like you've gotten over, but God's going to judge you. You may not get caught, but God sees you. And so that's the spirit of mammon that's back, back, uh, back on uh, the bottom of page 83. Um, it says Moses had not already uh, executed judgment of the firstborn of Egypt when his own sons were, were unmarked by the covenant. So, you know, when, when um, his wife told him, look, you know, he was going to, well, that's a whole nother story. We just want to understand manipulation is another impure motive. And then it says um, another impure motive uh, altar is on page 85. Um, many leaders have characterized lone individuals crying in the wilderness as wolves. So if you have a bunch of wolves in your, in your audience, if you see a bunch of wolves, particularly if you're an evangelist, you have to be careful when you catch a soul, the, the place that you release that soul is going to be very important. We don't want our catch to be released in a pond or in a forest that they will be eaten alive. And so we want to make sure that um, we don't release people into a wolf pack. If you're at a church that everyone's eating everybody, you're probably sewing into an impure altar. And you don't want to do that. If, if, if people are backbiting and snatching on each other and eating each other up, lying on each other, that is a sign. And I'm not saying if one person does that, because you have people, one or two people in a congregation that's, you know, they, we're all in the work of progress. But if, if you find the church is like that, that's an impure altar. Um, let me see. Uh, it says here, um, recognize wolves is easy. Look for the organization who wants you to join and consistently pay for the program. I've seen a lot of that. Yeah. Uh, another impure altar on page 86. Top of 86. Um, I can imagine Peter walking in some of the so-called prophetic, I mean, apostolic network to reach in the Ananias and Sapphira and Sapphira anointing. That's going to be another impure altar. When people are giving, how much did you give, Lyle? Oh, I gave a thousand dollars. He know he only gave a dollar. That's the Ananias and Sapphira's anointing where death is going to come on that person. That's going to be another a sign of, of an of a impure altar simply because you've got a bunch of lying spirits that aren't really given what they say they're going to give. It's not that when we're talking about the impure altar, it's not only the person that's giving the seed, but it's also the one that's giving the wave offering, which is the Le Levite or the main priest or the, or the priest of the house to give a wave offering unto God. Both of those things, as we learned last week, causes an impure altar. So you have to not only look at the people, but you have to look at the leadership because both of those things have to walk hand in hand. But if, if, if I am doing what I'm supposed to do with the offering and Lyle's not, God can still bless the altar of KBI because my heart and given that wave offering is pure. Peter wasn't destroyed, but Anirus and Sapphira were destroyed because their heart was wrong. They got the judgment, but the church still was existing. And so you really have to look at your life to see if your motives are pure or are you being run by the spirit, saying that you're giving something with the wrong motive. That's another one. Um, uh, that's a pure altar. I'm going to also go over pure altars that they show, but I'm going over the impure altar. The other impure altar is the perversion of the word for per personal purposes. 
And we see this a lot where I have a problem and I'm preaching about it on the pulpit on Sunday morning. Um, or I'm giving a word that's just twisted. That's going to be another sign of an impure altar. Um, so when you're, when you're pulling these things out, teachers, really look for these spots of impure altar so people can start building a list of impurities. So as we're going through the various chapters, they will know pure from impure. And, it, and then we could have a list of those things as they go back in their notes and seeing how that how that operates. Um, let me go back through here, make sure there, I don't have any more markings for impure. Um, the pure altars in this chapter, um, well, first thing, if you have manipulated, if you have been operating under the spirit of manipulation, just repent. It says right there on page 84. All you gotta do is repent. Recognize you're doing it and then repent for doing it and then do the right thing. Be obedient to what God is telling you to do, what he's telling you to, to uh, sow. Remember, he, it's where the Lord chooses for your tithe to go. You have to pray and say, Lord, where do you want my tithe and offering to go? I'm in prayer right now about the, the offerings that I'm giving because my tithes and offering are pretty excessive. And, and I'm saying, well, God, can I cut back on my offering, not my tithe, so that I can get my house paid off fast? <laughs> because I'm trying to get my kids' kids supposed to have an inheritance. And I'm in excess of the 10% in my tithes and offering. And I'm like, well, what do you want me to do? Do you still want me to put all that I did last year Always assess yourself about where, where you can go. Where can you, what does God want you to do? Where does God choose to put the offerings? Where does God choose for your money to go? And I'm in that process now of paying. Maybe he'll say no. Maybe he'll tell me to stop getting my nails done. I don't know. But I'm going to do whatever he tells me to do because I, I understand the scripture says that you're still leaving inheritance for your children's children. If I leave, if I die and I have debt, that's not giving my kids a blessing. That's giving them stress. So I don't want them to have stress. So pray about it. We have not taught the believers to get, to get the voice of God and seek his face for direction of what to give where. And um, giving to my kids by giving my house paid off, I guess, if you were thinking about it, that's still a blessing unto God. You might say, well, that's a personal thing. No, this is a generational blessing. Why can't I not serve so my kids can have a generational blessing? It, 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 it's, it, it's all his money. And so I'm trying to find out the best use of money. So I'm looking at it. If I can save $82,000 in interest, you don't think that's a good use of money? $82,000 is a lot of money to save, right? <laughs> she, only had to, she only had to sell like $150,000 worth of food. <laughs> Deuteronomy 26 <laughs> reveals covenant relationship through the tithe is a pure offer. That's going to be somewhere, if you're making a covenant tithe, that's going to be a place where the word is going forth, God's word is in, is in effect, you are growing. Deuteronomy 26 reveals that that covenant relationship through the tithe is, 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 is a pure altar. Um, in the middle of page 86, the second paragraph. The first paragraph talks about an offering. The second is, is a pure. And then halfway down there, the conclusion is impure offering. Okay. Um, when we talk about uh, uh, KBI, it says on page 87, and have given it to the Levites, the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow. So we as KBI, we are getting CIA, we give, so that's people, 
We give honorariums, that's people. When I get honorariums, I sell it back into the ministry. I don't take honorariums because I choose not to. I choose to give the money to the, to, to the church. So I don't get paid for even when I go out speaking arrangements. I give it to the church so we can honor somebody else. Ministers, um, we pay, like I said, we pay for, for Teresa when, when she went to Arizona. That was sewing into her, her trip uh, for that to happen. Although I don't think it happened the way I wanted it to happen, but she was still paid, paid, paid for uh, travel expenses, food expenses. Um, we went out tonight. That came out of, because this is serving people. So that money comes out to serve the people that went out and ministered today. That's a side of the Levites because we were in ministry mode today. We went out to dinner. So I used that portion to pay for the ministers. That's honorable. And so when we honor God with the money that we sow and that where we, where we send it and we, it's at the right place, honors that place. I'm looking for places that God will honor. I'll pay that bill because God's going to honor that. It's not that I just think I'm so good. It's just God will honor that because I'm serving the Levites at that point. Does, does that make sense? <laughs> So as teachers, as you're going through this, look for the pure altars, look for the impure altars and find ways that people are not pure, that you can kind of bring that out. Obedience is better than a formula. Okay, that's on page 88. Obedience to God is better than following the formula. Don't worry about the formula. Worry about your obedience. Um, it talks about the distribution, and I have to make sure when I write things out that it's being distributed properly and in the right in the right order. I might not be doing the accounting on the money, right, in the cost centers, but I am at least spending on the things that the for building and for the people. So I'll leave it there. Those were my uh, my marks, Teresa, for those things. Okay. I have other things that I mark personally, but for the class. Any questions? No, that, that's any, good. Also. <laughs> any questions on any of those? No, but Apostle, talk about when you give an offering to pray over your offering, what, what you want out of it. Yeah, I, ha I haven't read that so far in Al's book, but one of the teachings that we have is um, if I make an offering, I labeled, they label the seed because it is a seed. If you put a seed in the ground, if it's an apple seed, you know it's an apple seed because the label on the package says apple seed. So I want apples to raise. So I put apples on the seed so I can see the tree raise. So I say for you, when you give a, an offering, put on the check what the seed is for. What is the seed in your life? Because how are you going to know that you're getting the blessing from your seed? And so I label my offerings. I say what I want to grow from giving this offering. Because why? The offering is for building. Why can't you be built up by the seed that you sow? And so uh, I've been telling you this, you guys, this for years to... Name your seed. At least you can at least ask God what it is so that you know when it comes back that it'll be blessing. And you have to be specific because God is funny. You know, when I was going to some trip, I asked God for the ticket to be less. And I prayed. Well, the next day I checked the ticket, it was less. <laughs> I mean, I was like, really, God? You got what you asked for. Come on now, you put a... I wanted more than a penny or a dollar. You could have done something more than that, but okay, it was less. I'll buy this ticket. I mean, it was really pathetic, and he just laughed at me. <laughs> but he's that specific. It was less. He answered my prayer. Thank <laughs> <Like> you. <laughs> I, I can't. God's told me to give to very specific amounts to specific people but not so much specific amounts to churches. Well, the, the, 
he, he should tell you because if he's telling you to give the people, he's the, the scripture is talking about where you give your tithe and offering to. I know that I, I think I told you guys the story for specific people I was giving to, we were as a ministry given to Africa. Oh, uh, Kamada, I was sharing the reports from Wisdom. You know, you were seeing the stuff we were building in Africa. And then God said, stop sowing into Africa because we were sowing into JGM, who was also sowing into Africa. So he was getting double, a double from the same stream because I was sending money to JGM, who was sending money to Africa. So he's getting, he's making reports to JGM that the money's being used to buy a Lala hat. He's sending me a report that says he's using the money to buy Lala hat. Well, if JGM money's used to that. How come wisdom money's being used for that? And so I began to just divert all our funds into JGM. And then they sold into Africa. And shortly after, Africa she was told to stop sowing in Africa too. So being obedient, not only to people, because God tells me to sow into people, but that does not negate the fact that he told me to give a tithe and the offering to the place that you have your storehouse. I mean, he's, he's already prescribed it, a tithe and an offering. And so an offering is anything you want, a tithe is a tenth. So he's already prescribed that. So we don't have to pray, you know, how much should I give? He's already said it. Um, but that does not negate alms giving. That does not negate giving to people. None of that is negated. He 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 wants you to do both. The more you sow, the more that goes. <laughs> that I have found. I asked God years ago how I can become financially free, and His answer to me was, "When you begin to give finances freely." I was, that blew me away, and I started giving money away. I gave money away. I was doing everything I could to get money out my hand. And do you know what happened? I became financially free. I am debt free. The only debt I have is my house. I have no debt. People are calling me to get the credit cards. I got my score. And I said, no, that's okay. I, I, I don't want it. I am financially free because I give finances freely. I'm telling you, you cannot outdo God. He's shown himself to me to be faithful in that. I don't receive very well, but I sure do give well. <laughs> Wendy's working on me in receiving. So pray for her. <laughs> so you were slapping me around. <laughs> Go ahead, T. Did I answer your question, David, though? Yep, that was good. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead, T. I'm glad that you talked about for the teachers how to um, pull out and, and the impure altars and the pure altars. Because mm -hmm. I wasn't really sure how to do this. Mm -hmm. So that that helped a lot. I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. So now I know how to what to look for. Oh, another thing, when you talk about census offering, assessment offering, and free will offering. We knew what those the free will offering is. We do that all the time. But, but I, no one asked what a census offering is and an assessment offering. Okay. I don't know, do you know what it is? One's an assessment and a CID. <laughs> one's an assessment, one's a census, right? <laughs> what does that mean? I don't know. You're going to tell us. <laughs> and now what? Census like numbers of people. So is it like that? No. Okay. Then let me That's your homework assignment. To ask you? No. <laughs> yeah, I'm asking them. Find out what a assessment and a, and, a, and a census offering is. I know what it is. Oh, okay, well, then what is it? I don't believe you. you just... <laughs> but when you have things, the whole point of this is when you have things in scripture, you don't know what they mean. Maybe you didn't, mm -hmm. maybe didn't matter. <laughs> But find out what that is, because is that an offering that we should be paying? And if we should be paying, what's the reward of it? See, if you don't know what it is, how are you going to know if you're getting the reward from it? Right? 
And I can just give you a hint that, a one, that one of the things we talked about was the thing that I'm talking about, that I told you that I'm praying about. One of these offerings has to do with that. So, about your house? There's a little hint. One of these offerings has to do with that. So, <laughs> I'll let you figure it out. <laughs> Okay, so any terms or words that you don't necessarily understand, even as a teacher, think about, well, what would a student might ask? Well, no one asked that question, but, you know, if they say that these are the offerings in which we're seeking to get people to understand how to sow, if there's an offering that's there that we don't understand, teachers do that extra due diligence to do the research. So either you can answer the question if asked, or you can provide more information instead of just saying census offering, assessment offering, and fill a free will offering for uh, offerings to build, to build, right? Does that make sense, T? Mm -hmm. That makes sense. You know, Pastor, when you were talking about manipulation, the Lord brought uh, to my remembrance a time when I was at this church, Pastor Brenda was there, and prophet Kathy were there and there was this prophet I guess she was a woman mm -hmm. and she was doing the offering you mean you didn't know she was a woman I'm well just I'm kidding. just saying she was a woman. <laughs> okay. oh, oh no <laughs> and, um, she was like okay lock the doors nobody leave oh. and then she was saying Okay, if you're gonna give um a thousand, give a thousand, a five hundred. She went from a thousand all the way down to twenty bucks. Wow! And it didn't sit right with us. We were like, "What the heck is going on?" You know? Right. I can imagine Prophet Brenda went like this. Yeah, yeah, it was crazy. I, it was crazy. She went from here to her money amount being high, like $500, $1,000, something like that. And then she went all the way down to $20. But to lock the doors and not let, not let nobody leave, and then to how sure. she did it, it just wasn't right. Yeah, she would have been cursing. I can tell you the reason why the door was locked, because Lyle just said it, a curse was actually being released. And mm -hmm. I can tell you this. I was at a very known prophet in the country's meeting. Man, she was like hitting it. I was like, man, that's good. Oh man, that, ooh. And then, then it got to the offering. And she did this flip. And I was like, wait, what, what just happened? I was with two other people. One was a prophet and one was a prophet in training. I said, did y'all feel that? Did, did y'all hear that? And they're like, what? what? And I said, y'all didn't feel that? Y'all didn't hear that? Her whole, a new spirit manifested. It was a whole new spirit. It's like her countenance changed. No, it was a whole new spirit. It was a whole new spirit that manifested. It was a demon. And that spirit, the two people, the prophet, prophet they both went up and gave. I'm like, are they crazy? And I had to get out of that place. When I got home, that spirit was on me. I had to literally call Bishop and she had to deliver me. And this is what she told me that day. I was going there to support this other prophet that was teaching at this particular event. I didn't ask God, I was going to support my friend. Bishop told me at that meet, at that time, after she delivered me, pulled that rascal, I forget what the spirit was. I wrote it down in my journal, but I forget what the spirit was, but I had it. Man. It wasn't that. I forget what the spirit was. But she said, don't you ever go to a place without asking God because your anointing is too important. Oh, that's good. Because people will draw and uh, contaminate your anointing. And that taught me a hard lesson because I couldn't shake that thing off. People want to contaminate your anointing. Mm. You have to protect yourself from demonic contamination. I don't care who the prophet is. 
and she was doing a good word, but that spirit flipped so fast that it was like my head spun. She contaminated. Why? How, how did the contamination happen? Because truth opened me up. It's truth that I was to receive. To receive, now the people in the room are open. So the transformed itself, and now that you're open, you mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. What do you mean? I'm seeing her too when she came. And <laughs> I learned my lesson, and I don't care who it is. If God doesn't tell me to go, I'm not going. You have to understand the spiritual realm. And now that same prophet has a prayer that they offer to teach you how to pray for $1,500. They're still on TV, you know. Oh, can I go listen? Oh, it's horrible. It's hard. They're fine. Oh my gosh, I can tell you some stories. It's just horrible. Anyway. Always ask God. <laughs> don't always ask God and don't let anyone contaminate your anointing. Don't, don't allow, I don't care who they are. The same thing happened when I was with Benny Hinn. I was at his conference. <laughs> mm -hmm. I left. I, I I left in the middle of the thing. I yeah, I, I've been around some well-known people that flipped. Now after Benny Hinn, he did at least repent for what he had done. And he lost a big following because of his repentance. But I saw him before his repentance. <laughs> yeah. I got beat up with Tay several times before I understood. Yeah, I'm getting beat up now. <laughs> I've been around all these meat saints. <laughs> she needs some deliverance. She gave me the evil eye, Wendy. <laughs> Go ahead, T. I'm, I'm done with that chapter. Okay, um, chapter seven is the spirit of Amen. Um, it showed up in, now I don't even know how to do this. <laughs> <laughs> you do it the way you prepared it. Okay, um, there's a spirit called Amen that is opposed to any restoration and blessing that God would like to bring to his people. Nehemiah 2, 19 through 20 says, but when Sanballat the Horonite, Tobiah the Ammonite official, the Ammonite official and Geshem, the Arab heard of it, they laughed us to scorn and despised us and said, what is this thing that you're doing? Will you rebel against the king? So I answered them and said to them, the God of heaven himself will pro prosper us. Therefore, we, his servants, will arise and build, but you have no heritage or right or memorial in Jerusalem. So here in this scripture, this is where Ammon first reared its head, the spirit of Ammon. And they were against Nehemiah built, rebuilding the wall in Jerusalem. And so the spirit of Ammon began to rise up in alliance with others to thwart God's plan through ridicule, mockery, persecution, and using political government, they attempted to stop God's purpose. And so when the demon of Ammon uses people to oppose our God-ordained purpose, God expects it through covenant to invoke spiritual, judicial authority. And I want to ask you about that, Apostle. What, what, what exactly is that? Sorry, where, where are you? Well, I, I said, um, when the demon of Ammon uses people to oppose our God-ordained purpose, God expects us through covenant to invoke spiritual, judicial, bottom of page 97, authority. Well, what is that? Judicial, How do do that? Judi judicial authority is to begin to declare, decree, and um, command 
God's blessing over whatever it is that God has promised you. The spirit of Ammon, for example, I underline how Ammon, the spirits that are operating. So um, humiliation, they take territory, oppression, they conquer you, disgrace, they invade you, they're ruthless, okay? The list goes on. Now, to take judicial authority over that spirit, let's just say that he comes to conquer you. You take judicial authority over a false conqueror because he created us to have authority and dominion. And we begin to declare and decree that he is not the conqueror, but he's the conquered. I'm the conqueror because God made it that way. So I begin to make declarations and decrees of God's promises and not what this spirit of Ammon is trying to do. That's, that's how you do it. Does that make okay. sense? Yeah, that makes sense to me. And then I put, we must arise and call for covenantal intervention. Mm -hmm. The Davidic Psalms are examples for us on how to pray, what to ask and what to expect. So we can go to the, song, the Psalms and we can pray the prayers that David prayed against his enemies. And that teaches us how to pray, what to ask and what to expect when we pray the prayer, the Psalms prayers. Yeah, if you go back to Reese, look on the bottom of page seven, seven, how do, how do you pray judicially? I want you to underline. You're going to oppose anything that's working against your God-ordained purpose. So you as an evangelist, you have the authority as an evangelist. So anything that opposes your God-ordained purpose, that's a demon that you can pray judicially over. That's one way. And declare and decree by, by declaring and decree. Mm -hmm. and, okay. And, and, and beginning to enforce who you are and your purpose. Okay. God, are, huh? Are these the same judicial prayers that we use um, uh, to, I'm going to call them emergency prayer, the God, get them God prayer? They're, they're, they are uh, turn and burn prayers. Okay. Judicial prayers are turn and burn prayers. This time. Right here. Yeah, all the judicial prayers are the same. But this is coming up against the the spirit of Ammon, but say that spirit of Ammon is, is in Charlotte. And Charlotte is operating in, I don't know, trying to take territory. So I'm going to be praying a turn or burn against Charlotte if she doesn't repent that God, the, the thing that she's trying to take from me, my territory, take it from her. And then give me her, give me the spoils of the things she tried to take, and from me, give me what she has. Okay, so, um, I talked about this before, so I'm, I'm I'm looking at this as a for people that are watching from the world when they watch our YouTube. I have a friend that I talk about often, and she's a witch, and she uses these prayers in the opposing way, mm -hmm. and so um, in a spite. Out of spite from a different spirit. She's coming from another spirit that's not from God, but it's the same prayers. I have word for word from the Bible. She's using these prayers. Mm -hmm. And so the difference I know the difference is who are you serving? Who are you yielding your your gift to? But what's the difference for the world to know we ain't praying like that? We're not we're not saying witchcraft when we're 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 calling the things of God as He told us to. Does that make sense? What we're saying because when I say stuff like that, like my son, if I say, uh, you know, whatever I'm saying, someone that was speaking death over my kid or something, um, he would say, uh, that sounds like a witch when I would pray or pray. Mm -hmm. He would he would he would he would turn it on me and and try to strip me of my authority that God gave me to declare life and also to say boomerang that thing off of my baby. You know what I'm saying? Get that right. off of my baby. He would then turn it around and try to convict me and say, uh, don't pray like that for me because that, 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 that's witchcraft is what he would say. And, and the, the reason why for the church that we haven't learned to walk in that dimension because most often people have learned priestly prayers, which is forgive them they know not what they do. Like, have mercy on them. That's what we've learned to do. 
And so when you phrase you differently, the only persons that they heard do that are witches. The other side. So since their ear is tuned toward the demonic, they're giving that power over to the wrong source. Mm -hmm. When the demon actually understands the authority, because God has got a principle, and they're praying the principles of God to destroy Christians. Yeah, and the prayer works. Of course it does. And from the Bible, the word of God doesn't lie. And then it does what it's set out to do. And so teaching the church, like I told you, church, you know, learning how to pray in the authority that God's given you because we've got to take it by force and stop being in. Right. But a lot of people go walk in that dimension. I see you. They haven't seen that dimension. And so the only place they've seen that dimension is on the other side. Yeah, so they try to turn it against you and they're like, you can't fight back. Tell yeah. them to kick rocks. That's what I think. Kick rocks. <laughs> because I know the word and I'm praying the word just because you don't understand it doesn't mean I have to come to your level. I'm going to the level where God has placed me. And they may or may not be, but that's okay. Yes, sir. It was like, like you said, how they, uh, the witches will use the word of God, right? Mm -hmm. Word for word. The devil knows the power of God's word. Now, when the devil was tempting Jesus in the de desert after his 40 days of fasting, when he, he used scripture, but Jesus did not say that is not what the word of God said. He countered it with True, because the devil used partial instead of the full thing. That was a twisted that he was talking about. Mm -hmm. You use the uh, whole word. Rightly divided the word of truth. Yeah, rightly divided the word of truth. It's like when I slipped the last time on drinking, the devil used the word of God. You know, it's okay for oh, three to just, just, just a little bit, a little bit, you know, you know, and then pastors around me were, you know, drinking a little bit. I was like, okay. But finally, after I went through all that, the Lord said, no more. Because of, because of what I know what I'm called to do. He's like, not for you. He's like, yes, it is true. For some, even some priests can't. Not me. Not me either. <laughs> not me either. Yeah. It was like, me three, me four. What's like? Okay. Go ahead, T. Well, oh, I'm just loving this. I'm learning. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's good. Right. That's what Bible study is supposed to be for. Not service, but study and learning. Um, I put when the spirit of Ammon gets, well, I want to say like Davidic prayer psalms, Davidic psalms are like judicial prayers, right? The, the David psalms, they, he does have some judicial prayers, yep. And he will talk about smite their jaws and their teeth and break their teeth rough. and Rough, excuse me. Yeah, he was pretty rough. <laughs> yeah, he was. Um, I put the spirit of Amen gets involved in the storehouse. It will drive all the Levites out to work their own fields or find a secular job, and not being able to devote themselves to prayer and the ministry of the word. Um, I'm on page 100. When ministry is thwarted, thwarted. I might. I really didn't find. Anything to pull out on 98, 99, I could be wrong. I probably am wrong. Oh. But I went to when minister is thwarted. So when the spirit of Amon gets in the storehouse, it will drive all the Levites out of the field. No longer was a full flow of ministry available for God's house. When Tobiah, who represents the spirit of Amon, controlled the storehouse, the Levites could no longer work together as God intended. When Tobiah set up his home in the storehouse, meaning the church intended for the Levites, the purpose and plan of God was immediately thwarted. The Levites had to work their own fields or in our language, work a secular job, the longing devoting themselves to prayer and the ministry of the word. So this tells me when the spirit of Amen comes in into the ministry, it's, it doesn't allow the ministers to do what they need to do. As far as ministering the word and prayer, it's like Amen's coming to take control. 
He wants to take control of what's going on within the service, within the ministry and everything. Am I, am I reading that right? And more importantly of the storehouse, the okay. funds that are coming in and out. A lot of times you see this in something called a deacon or board, a trustee board, where the pastor wants to do something and the trustee board says, no, we can't let that happen. Mm -hmm. You know, they want okay. to control the, the money. Then I put, when the spirit of Ammon sets up his house in the storerooms, everything that came in, like you said, the, the, the funds is under the spirit's control. But when people who truly love and want to do God's will, there is care for one another and recognize the need of others is more important than one's own personal ambition. The spirit of Ammon defiles an altar and turns it into a place of self-advancement, rule, and promotion. The spirit must be prayed out of the church and be replaced with the true heart of God's intention for considering the offering and the tithe. You have anything, Apostle? Think about the toilet being flushed. I know. <laughs> I'm thinking you... about sewage downstairs. <sighs> There's something downstairs? Uh, well, sorry. I, I'm, I'm not, we're, we're just all kind of distracted, but. Oh. Sorry. My crap. <laughs> My oh no. Okay. We'll finish. Um <laughs> we're thinking about the sewage. Every time that he flushed, you flush, I'm thinking about the sewage coming up. Now eventually have to flush. Oh my gosh. Sorry. Go ahead. Uh yeah. So the first That's pretty much everything I have, Apostle, for Amen. So the things that thwart the ministries that is the purposes and plans of God, which you said, that's the number one. Number two is the Anais and Sapphira, where they have their own uh, two hearts. What heart are you really serving? Are you serving with a pure heart or are you serving with an impure heart? Those are going to be your two con contrasts. Um, and then whose control is your money? Who, who controls the money in that you give or don't give? Um, and who's controlling that in the ministries that you're sowing into? Um, that's going to be important for this particular spirit. I got a question, Apostle. Uh -huh. um, when we, let's say we pray and the Lord says, give your tithes here or give your offering here, right? He, it directs us. We seek his face and he directs us where to go. Right. We do what the Lord says, but when it's released to the church or the ministry and they don't do right by it, we're not, we're not judged for that, right? No. Well, that's why you're learning what a pure and impure altar is. Now, if God tells you to sow in an altar and you find out that that altar is impure, then one, do you continue to sow there? Or two, did you hear, did you hear God right? Right? Okay. Right. You have to continue to ask the question. Every year I'm asking, what do you want me to do with my tithe and my offering? This year I didn't give her first fruit. Let, generally I give her first fruit and I pray, who do I give my first fruit offering to? Um, and then sometimes that's split up. This year I didn't give her first fruit offering. He didn't tell me to give it to anyone. So I put it towards my mortgage. <laughs> uh, you know, I just, ask, I at least ask, what do you want me to do? So that's my practice every year to ask, do I go up? Do I go down? What do you want me to do with my offering? So you have, I you know, know. I, do, I do it yearly. And when I go into a church, that's going to be an offering because I'm not going to, I don't tithe to a church that I visit. I give an offering. And so I ask, what do you want me to give? He'll either tell me an amount or he'll tell me nothing. <laughs> Literally, nothing. <laughs> that means he doesn't want me to sow into that altar and I won't get anything. You know, Apostle, just I just want to, um, personally, I, I tithe, right? I do tithe. And then I wasn't doing an offering though. I was tithing and the Lord got on me on that. He says, you need to start doing offering and you tithe, but you have to now do offering. And 
I felt, I was like, oh, okay. You know, I, I didn't, I, to me, in my mind, I was like offering what like, what, what I, before we did this class and stuff, this teaching, offering to me was if you want to do it or if you don't want to do it. That's how I thought about it. Mm -hmm. But I see it's something that God does command, but he wants it out of the purity of our heart and out of us wanting to do it to please him. Yeah, because it says, how have we robbed God with tithes and offerings? <laughs> it doesn't just stop with tithe. It's yeah. offerings, right? And right. so that's why we need to understand what these offerings are to see how you're robbing God. And then, you know, repent and just fix it. You know, it's like, you know, you, you, you can't be judged for what you don't know. You, we're doing the best we can, right? And so just do different. Yeah. And I'm telling you guys, you can't be given. <laughs> you cannot be God given. You will become financially free when you start giving your finances freely. That really just changed my paradigm. It was a paradigm shift for me. It was, it was a game changer. So do what you want to do. It says here that everyone who is numbered in the census from 20 years old and upward shall give the Lord's offering. So it comes from being numbered, anyone who is 20 years old and upward. Well, that will be everybody in this ministry. Oh, no, my, my mentality is like... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you're only a three-year-old. I can have 17 long over here. Yeah. All right. I'll go... I'll, I'll, I'll go with that. Go ahead. That's what the census offering says, and the assessment offering. Don't tell them. It's their homework. That's what I know. I'm doing my homework. No. Uh, Latanya had something she wanted to say. Okay. I'm it's sorry. A, I think it really showed where. Can y'all hear her? You guys can hear me. You know how loud I am. Yeah, I'm speaking like loud. You can really look at it when you do your budget. When you look at your budget and you see what what you're what you're doing, you it really shows you where your heart is because even though I pay tithes and offerings, you know, the bulk of my money is spent on food. And so I'm feeding something, I'm feeding a spirit. Do you follow what I'm saying? That's that's the bulk of my money is going into. So it, it's just like I'm not, I'm I, it's where most of my money is spent. Um, I'm taking someone out to eat. It's all. Um, it's always associated with eating. It's it's something. It's a, it's gluttony. There's greed there. It's like really really obvious. So someone told me, you guys, that uh, it was a, it was a, it was an apostle. I was a, I, I took ties off of my food stamps. I mean, I was really I really was really in a choco with this church where they were getting me for everything. I mean, everything. I mean, the pastor was coming to my job and picking up my time on a daily basis because I was I was doing hair and whatever I made. It was like I was getting spent. And I would put my time in one pocket and I would put my my earnings in another. Some days I would forget which pocket was in. And I give the other pocket, the, the part, you know what I'm saying? The 90% because I'm just, he's just there and he was just collecting. And I was, it, it was, it was just so crazy. And so I had been all giving where it was, where I was getting, where I was getting duped. And then I have been on another spectrum where an apostle told me that uh, tithes and offerings were like a no, that I didn't have to do it. And that. I have been getting ripped off all these years and that it wasn't a commandment. And I stopped. And you know what my justification was? Well, I gave over $2,000 one year to this church and I was I was homeless and you know what I'm saying? And, and I was just like, I surely I had some bread built up <laughs> from all the times that I was getting ripped off. Or you know what I'm saying? Paying tithes on food stamps. Well, you know what I'm saying? Which isn't even, it's crazy. You know, they have my food stamp card. And, and I have my kids, and I was on Section 8. And so I've been through these ups and downs with tithes now, where we're tithes and offerings now, to where it's like, it, it's like I don't even have that relationship that I had when I was younger, which I really felt the joy of giving. 
And in my, I'm telling you right now, I was on, in from Section 8, and my first year coming out of beauty school, I made over $80,000. And and I was doing well, you know, she paying my tithes and offerings, but I got pissed off, and it just burned me out. It's like, I don't want people like that. And that's how I got to this church was this apostle did not uh, collect offerings. And I watched her, and I was like, why is she not accepting offering? And it was like a uh, light comes out of my head that her heart was for the people. Her heart wasn't to get the money, like the one Nina Bottoms and the other conferences that I went to, where I realized that they were using their, they were prostituting their anointing. So the anointing's still there, but they use it to manipulate, and she wasn't doing that. And that's how I got here. And when I started saying that there was a person that was burnt out on this first thing, Hey, Apostle, you know, we're supposed to be doing an offering. And I would start saying, hey, can I do the offering? Because I know that there's a blessing in it because it's from the obedience perspective that we're doing it. Um, you know, not, you know, uh, you know, like the long um, walk of shame. I can't do it when the damn man walking, like the walk of the three mile, like, you know, the depression. It's because it's associated with a blessing from God. And that's how my I can't focus on the people that have written me off. I have to focus on this is out of my obedience and it's not like to God. It's, just, it's almost solidifying my walk as this is who I am as a Christian because I'm taking my first fruit and I'm giving it to the Lord. It's fun to have to say that. I've definitely been ripped off. And so that will turn you off. But when you see it from the perspective of God, of this person not here for that. You're not going to look at giving it to the person. It's going to be more like I'm giving it to the Father. And then once it leaves my hand, I believe that I'm here. And this is the good ground that I'm coming on. So I'm, I'm, I'm leaving it to God. And whatever happens after that, I did my part. But I have to say that because there's some scammers out here. There's some people that will tell you what they want. The lady that I know, she's an apostle. She's rich. And I realized that it's from heaven. Give me, give me, give me. Because she doesn't pay tithes and offerings. She's like, well, you know, it's, it's my church, I don't want to pay it to myself. And I'm thinking, yeah, I pay to something, but it's for the church. I can't control that. I can only just start from where I am. And, and I wouldn't even keep in the checklist when I was in prison, like, oh, I'm going to pay this amount. I owe this for my 32 cents. Like, I'm going to, you know, so that's it. Sorry for the long speech. I just wanted to share the ups and downs of this in ministry over 20 years. That, that's a lot what happened, like what happened to me. It was like, I was giving tithes and offerings to the, it was like $800 a month, you know, and um, I didn't know anything about tithes and offerings. I just knew that you're supposed to give tithes and offerings. So I did it for, for a very long time. And then I got laid off and they didn't know me. They couldn't you. I went to jail. Oh, God. Go ahead. So I, I, they, they didn't know me, and I was trying, you know, to find another job and um, ended up in, you know, I was living in a, in a shelter and whatever. And I went to see the pastor and, or, you know, do you belong to this church? I, I'm like, I'm <laughs> sitting up in here every week, and I'm here at Bible study on Tuesday nights. And then um, are you giving tithes? You know, like I couldn't see the pastor if I wasn't giving tithes and offering. So after that, I was just like, that's it. You know, I'll just, you know, participate, you know, do what I, you know, what I do. And I just stopped doing it because it was like, they, you know, they just, it was just like a slap in the face. It was like, they didn't want to know me. First, I was a friend of the ministry and then I was dirt. So it was like, yeah, the, the motives, the motive, the motive matter. Somebody asked somebody, one of you guys asked about, um, you know, if I do my part and God tells me to get to that place, isn't that enough? You also have to look at the blessing that's on the house. Is the house that you're sewing into getting the covenant promise. You know, that's really, and it's not just the covenant promise. 
for the ministry, but for the people in the ministry. As at least the people that are sowing it to the ministry. If you're not sowing it to the ministry, you got nothing to get back to get blessed by. But even in that, you can still get overflow. Just because the house is being blessed, you can, God's mercy can still bless you, even though you're not sowing into it. And so this book should be showing you not only your responsibility, but also what to look for mm -hmm. in what you're so into. That's what, that's what yeah. this is really trying to get you guys. You might leave KBI tomorrow. That's not the point. The point is you are a child of God and I want you to learn what's pure and impure. And so you, and it's not just in the church. It's in your job. It's, it's who you're giving your time to. Are you sowing your time to something pure and impure? I should leave your job. <laughs> we all work on the job. <laughs> I'm ready to impure all sorts of people. Just get ready. I agree with that now. <laughs> well, I'm going to be my job is It's funny, I was just looking at that guy reminded me of, and I feel really stupid about it that I didn't see it years ago, you guys. But I was a member of a deliverance ministry, you guys. And the pastor and first lady never cast any demons out. Only the visiting ministers that came were the ones that practiced the deliverance. So I was getting deliverance. So I'm like, you know, sewing into this ministry, I was getting deliverance, but it was only when the visitors came that the deliverance happened. Bishop, Bishop Green came. You know what I'm saying? They were calling in all these people that were powerful people, men and women of God, but they never once cast a demon out. This I was there for over 10 years, you guys, and it was called, oh, don't blankety blank, 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 but it had the name deliverance in it. And I was like, you know, just really believe in that. And then I, as I said on the couch, I was like, hmm, just now, and it's, I haven't been going there for years, that they never once cast a demon out of anybody. It was only the visitors, the visiting ministers that did the work. And so it was like, at the time I was deceived, I just was happy to be getting the freedom and waiting for the next uh, revival or yet visitor to come. And then that special thing would happen. And that would give me the juice to go forward. And then to the, you know, to the next, to the next event. It, it literally was like that. I didn't even know what deliverance was. Until I came here, I'd never heard of it. I actually grew up in churches where it actually happened on a regular basis. <laughs> like the tithe. Yeah, I, I, I should. <laughs> we, were, we were learning that stuff in YouTube. <laughs> as, as you should. A lot of churches don't. Like third generation Satan's bride. <laughs> like, let's put it like this her eyes were sunk in. She'd never seen the light. She had to wear sunglasses. And it took like three hours. And uh, we don't know what happened after. But. <clears throat> But she became born again that night and yeah. then she disappeared. Um, and the demons were really nervous. I mean, like hard. Like it wasn't, it wasn't, she wasn't joking. <laughs> like her eyes sunk in because lack of light. <clears throat> like, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anything else, T? Good job. She's up there sitting back with her mute. Just go. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's all I have. Thank you so much. Any questions or comments, concerns? No, nah, it was a good job, Teresa. And I, I do like this book because it answers a lot of stuff that we don't even know about in tied in and stuff like that. So it's been a blessing in my life. Good. Tim is going to hit the, the home run. He'll he'll teach the last the last class. I think he's going to teach on a Friday, though. I think I have him scheduled for a Friday. Tim? Tim, yeah. He's going to come down on a Friday um, and teach the last, not maybe from the book, he can teach whatever he wants, but I asked him to round out this teaching for us uh, so that we can get a father's perspective um, on all of this. So, yeah. We we'll have him for June 27th. That's a Tuesday. June 27th? Okay, that's when he's coming? Yeah, that's a Tuesday. Okay. Oh, we'll be here for it. Yep. So 
Yeah, that's the last class. And then July 4th, of course, is the following Tuesday. We'll have all and we'll start the new series, which I'm praying into what's our next thing. It'll be here for me before you know it. So I'm gonna have to listen and pray. He's gonna be here first. Yeah, he said he's gonna come down. Mm -hmm. He's been wanting to come down for months, so. Mm -hmm. I know for a little bit, I was listening to the a couple of times I went to the Thursday month. Oh yeah, I remember. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, T, you can call, you got something? Okay. I was just gonna say, um, you know, I was just thinking of how, um, uh, Apostle Taylor, it very, I, I feel like, uh, dun, 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 you know what I'm saying? Like the, the uncle you don't want to mess up in front of, you know what I'm saying? And I realized that that fear is not, I, I just observed it within myself, that it's not me because I know that he's a kind person and he's loving, but that's a spirit that you know what I'm saying? That's like, oh no, he's coming. You know what I'm saying? I can't explain it, but I just felt it. I felt that, you know, kind of like, I don't want to be here for that one, but I'm, I'm going to make sure that I'm here for that one because of that, because I felt that thing trying to, you know, keep me away from him. So I'm, that's going to make me go closer. Amen. Well, him and Brenda will be here, as Teresa said, 27th, so. We have to have a good dinner that day, Shelly. Taco Bell. Okay. We'll be praying to see what's going to be good. Yeah. I want to be here. I want to help. Yep. All right. Close this out. Okay. Father, we just come to you in the name of Jesus. We thank you for this time of study, revelation, Lord God, of your word. And we just thank you for um, everyone here, Lord God. And we pray that your spirit will always be with us. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Amen. Oh, one more thing. Good Thank job. Thank you, Teresa. Good job. Good job, Teresa. Thank you.